Hello, everyone. My name is James Britt. I'm the DHA Director of Public Engagement at ICA. I want to welcome everyone to the program this evening. Joining me in conversation are Louis Masai, an independent filmmaker and founder of the Scribe Video Art Center in West Philadelphia. Jonathan Moreno, the David and Lynn Silfen Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And Alex Pittman, who is a term, professor, term assistant professor of critical interdisciplinary studies and the assistant director for teaching and learning initiatives at the Center for Engaged Pedagogy at Barnard College. How are you all doing today? Great, very well, thank you. Great. Uh, this program is held in conjunction with artist Jessica Vaughn's exhibition, Our Primary Focus is to be Successful, which is now on view at ICA through May 9th. Please, please visit our website to reserve tickets and learn more about upcoming programs. Admission to all ICA exhibitions and programs is free. Captioning is provided by Caption Access to activate this service. Click on the button labeled CC at the bottom of your screen. We will engage in a dialogue for approximately 50 minutes and then open up discussion for questions from the audience. So please send your questions via the chat function. Special thanks to Derek Rigby, audio visual coordinator, Natalie Sandstrom, program coordinator, Meg Only, the Andrea B. Laporte associate curator, and of course, Jessica Vaughn for making this program possible. So I wanted to start out with this piece because it is the, the first piece in the exhibition as soon as you walk in. Um, that music is, is as Meg um, said in the, the, the artist talk, um, it's haunting <laughs> and it kind of sticks with you and stays with you as that 80s sort of vibe. It's um, on hold uh, music that's used by, by companies that you probably figured out. But you know, the two pieces that we're talking about, this one uh, and it's the title of the exhibition, our primary focus is to be successful and Greaves piece are essentially training um, training modules. Um, obviously, they have two different functions. Um, the other thing that sort of resonated with me was the language that was being used in that piece. And, and uh, again, there were a lot of parallels to what we're going to discuss with, with, the Graves, um, with the Graves film. So let's just start there. If we can, you know, I was fortunate enough that, to have a conversation with, with these gentlemen a couple of weeks ago. We were having a great discussion. And um, to the point we had, we needed to to to, to put a cap on it because there were so many great things were coming out. So if we can just continue from where we started off before, and just talk about how this piece even came to fruition. Um. So so what what was the context in which in which um in which um it the genesis for it? Um. I can get us started if you'd like. Um, so first, I just want to thank um, the ICA for inviting me to participate in the roundtable. Um, and I want to say thanks as well to Jessica Vaughn for sharing this work. Um, I am in New York, so I did not have a chance to actually visit the exhibition, but I did get to um, take the virtual tour and I thought the work was really impressive and resonant and um, I really liked it a lot. So um, I'm really grateful to uh, be here in conversation with Louis and um, Jonathan. And um, I appreciate starting off with uh, that video um, and trying to think about it in relationship to Greaves' work. Um, I'm happy to kind of talk a little bit about um, some of the context for In the Company of Men, um, but uh, I don't want to take up too much time at first. I would make an observation actually about um, the thinking about In the Company of Men in relationship to um, uh, Vaughn's video. Um, one thing that really kind of, um, jumps out to me in that in terms of the language. I was really, was the first time I saw um, that film, it really reminded me of a section of In the Company of Men, which is the section toward the end where um, it's after the two, uh, the, the foreman and um, the, the workers have done their kind of combined session with each other. And there's a moment where somebody is asking Al Judge like, um, about what he would do in order to like um, keep a worker under control. And there's a moment where Al Judge starts to answer the question and suddenly a voiceover cuts in and it starts to reframe what he's actually doing and saying, not in terms of his own voice, but actually in terms of talking about how um, he is, um, has all this work potential and he's becoming part of the hardcore unemployed. So there's this strange way in which this um, language of um, the desire for diversity or the desire for inclusion 
is actually getting wrapped into kind of corporate values. And so I think in Greaves' work, you know, there is an attempt to have a real kind of um, social reckoning with uh, the inequalities of capitalism um, that uh, is not as present in some of those um, later kind of like training films that Vaughn is drawing upon. Um, but you can see the traces of like how we come up to this process, even within, I think, Greaves's, uh, Greaves's particular work. Um, in that case. So I just want I would just want to throw out that observation before um, we kind of get into talking about Greaves's uh, film in particular. And I'd love to hear if there are connections that um, Louis and Jonathan, you all are also seeing there. No, Alex, it's, it's, it's very, very interesting that you that you that you mentioned that because as, as I was looking at, at, at uh, in the company of men and really thinking of it as being um, its reason being that it, as a training film, um, there is this tension within the film that uh, in some ways suggests that uh, uh, some of that social, social reckon, reckoning is, has not been reconciled and will not be reconciled. Um, and which actually comes out of these different traditions of documentary. I mean, one is the kind of um, scripted, um, scripted narrative, which is what a you know a training film is. I mean, you 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 know what all the elements are. And then the other is a more observational, more direct cinema, cinema verite, where what emerges is what is happening in front of you, and sometimes. Um, uh, it doesn't follow. It doesn't follow the script. So um, yeah, that, that, that's and and then the, the the third element is you know so uh, you know sort of relying on the the psychodrama or, or the the um, uh, what, what do they call it within the film? Um, um, sociodrama. The, not not sociodrama, but there, there's another term that they use within the film. Uh, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm blanking out on it. Um, but yet it, it is a sociodrama, which, which Jonathan can talk much more about. But uh, so, but you have these. It's it's sort of like Greaves in construct in, in using the sociodrama, thinking, okay, I'm going to find the drama in you know taking this technique as a way to to give the film a kind of narrative. But in some ways, the what's not reconciled, what what is actually observed, as opposed to what is um, uh, planned, I think is one of the more interesting things in it. You know, both of you have said things that made me think about the tension in the film, but also in the technique. Is this, is this racial reconciliation? Is that what this film is about? Is it modeling it? Or is it about training the so-called hardcore unemployed, all of whom happen to be black, adapting them to whiteness? and white expectations. And this is a long-standing conflict in the way that my father used role-playing or role training. In, in the early 1930s, his first big gambit, which became rather famous, was when he was invited to a girls' reform school uh, it, it, called the Hudson Training School for Girls. These were four, generally 13, 14, 15 year old girls who were, would have been considered sort of juvenile delinquents and they were sent to this place. And he was brought in, in the first instance, to redesign the, the, the structure of the school, the social structure, so that there wouldn't be so many girls running away and so much behavior trouble. But then he said, you know, what we really need to do is train these girls who have no skills how to function outside. So he, he, he trained them in the, and there's a little, there's some filming of this silent film from the early 1930s about how he trained them to be waitresses, for example. Now, you know, you could say, well, these girls were actually already exploited. Some of them had been abused. They, and they, Ella Fitzgerald was there uh, briefly and never wanted to talk about it or and so you know were they being forced to adapt right to the expectations of a society that had already screwed them over 
uh, or, you know, is this just the way of things? And, and when, you, when, when you were both talking, I was thinking, isn't that a question here? A question and attention. I, I mean, I would say it absolutely is. Um, I think it's right on the surface of the, of the documentary, that tension that's playing out. Um, there's uh, maybe, James, I think we may have already gone past your question a little bit. Should we, um, we'd set up a little bit the film itself and like where it they came from was that, that was the question you were prompting us to speak to, right? Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm glad that you all made those connections to, to Jessica's work though too, because mm -hmm. I, I think that, that many of the points you raise um, are very prominent. I mean, even just the language, I mean, to Jonathan's point, um, there, what, there's a section um, about um, alluding to that you had to adopt the values of the dominant group if, in order for you to, to be successful, in order for you to advance. So she's, she's bringing out those, those, very, those very dynamics um, that exist often in work culture. And in this, the conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago, Jonathan pointed out something that, you know, the, the first thing that you said that had resonated with you is that this was, could be applicable to today. And that was the first thing that I thought of too, when I, when I, whenever I watch those type of films or when I see things back in my parents' generation, I'm always struck with how relevant those things still are now, which yeah. you know, concerns me that we're still, and, and we're in the midst of these things right now, um, currently. Um, so, but yes, we can move forward to having, you know, breaking down more of the context of, of, of the film. Well, I would love to hear Alex, who's the expert on this, talk about how built came to make the film how did that happen um, yeah sure i can talk a little bit about that so i can to give the audience some context um i have a did some research for a book that i'm working on um about william greaves and about um in the company of men in particular and um, i had the opportunity to go to indiana university's black film center and archive in order to um, go through the william greaves papers that are collected there um, and I found out some pretty interesting um, uh, things about like both the production of the film and how it came about. I also can talk about this a little bit later on. There's a, um, Indiana University has a 16 millimeter version of the film that actually has a slightly different introduction than we see in the version that was screened last night. In fact, it's a different introduction than I think broadly circulates at all. Um, it's an introduction from um, a man named Harry Thompson, who was an ad executive for Newsweek. Um, but I can talk about that uh, a little bit later on. Um, so to give some context for how the film came about. Um, so William Greaves was approached by Newsweek magazine who wanted him to make a film that would be about an attempt to repair communication between white factory foremen and this group of people who referred to as the hardcore unemployed. And um, at first, Greaves did not actually want to make this film. Um, and his reasons for not wanting to make it um, were tied to what he, he felt would be a lack of creative autonomy in being able to produce the film that he really wanted to produce. And at first he turned down the offer, but I think with some more conversation uh, Newsweek guaranteed him that they would give him free reign to do whatever he wanted to do, as long as it achieved this goal of improving communication between white factory foremen and these black men who were labeled the hardcore unemployed. Um, and so he is the one who um, had the idea of bringing psychodrama or using psychodrama as a kind of agency for um, achieving this mandate that he was given. And um, he has a piece from 1969, I wanna say, um, that he published in Film Library Quarterly, um, which is a now out of print journal, but um, he published a very short little blog that accounts for the process of um, uh, being invited to make the film, how he kind of went about making the film and also what he was um, sort of interested in in the wake of it. And um, it's a real, I mean, it's one of the things that is a really um, enduring source of fascination for me with that work. Um, well, there are two things. Uh, one of them um, Louis touched on already, which is the way that he is really combining cinema verite as a kind of documentary technique 
along with psychodrama, which is all about kind of reenactment and role play. And um, I think that's, I, I get just um, a ton out of watching and rewatching this film and thinking about what he's doing by combining those particular um, strategies. Um, but the other thing that I think is very interesting to consider with this film is the fact that he was also making um, In the Company of Men at the same time that he was editing a film that he's perhaps best known for, which is Symbiopsychotaxiplasm Take One. Um, he had filmed Symbiopsychotaxiplasm Take One a year before, and then was in the process of editing, editing it when he made um, In the Company of Men. And what has been always interesting to me about thinking about these works together is they actually put psychodrama to almost completely different uses. Like in this one, it's about improving communication. But for anyone who's seen Symbiopsychotaxiplasm, um, if, you, if you have access to the Criterion channel, I highly recommend you go see it because it's an incredible film. Um, but in that one, he almost, he uses these psychodramatic techniques actually as a kind of irritant so that it's like gets under the skin of his uh, film crew and it leads to them kind of like revolting against his direction. So there's a very interesting way in which he's using psychodrama to achieve like lots of different purposes um, and bring people into collaborations in very different ways that I think is, um, is really compelling there. Alex, do you know why that particular auto plant was, was selected? So um, they initially tried to film it in the North um, they were starting off in the Northeast. I've, I don't know if it was in New York or somewhere else, but they were starting off in the Northeast and actually they couldn't get the factory foreman in the North to open up at all. They like could, they, could, they, the, they really didn't have any sort of receptiveness to participating in this experiment with psychodrama. So I, I'm not sure exactly what led them um, to uh, Georgia um, as I think this is filmed um, if not in Atlanta, at least around Atlanta. Um, but he ended up finding, he found the factory foremen were much more open to the possibility of engaging with this in the South than they were in the North. So that was what, that's what kind of led us. But I think there might be some combined footage between the two, because they did some amount of filming in the Northeast um, for this. And was it just that take or were there other, did he have other um, encounters with the foreman and with those workers, and then did they improve? Did they eventually improve? You know their communication. Did things become better as a result of these exchanges? I don't know how much of a relationship they had after the fact. So he does allude in the log to the fact that he showed he did a screening of the film with um, both groups of men. And um, he says, he said, in sort of an offhand comment, he says like, he's very happy with how they responded to it and they really appreciated the film. And now he's moving on to working on Symbiopsychotaxiplasm. That's about the extent of what um, I know about his, uh, his ongoing relationship with them. Um, I do know that um, one of the men who features very prominently, Al Judge, um, he, uh, he did end up getting, uh, work in the wake of this. Um, it's alluded to in the syllabus that um, was produced by Newsweek and was distributed along with um, the film. And it provided all kinds of information about um, this group that was known as the National Alliance of Businessmen, um, which were responsible for kind of running a lot of these training programs. Um, and it also provides a lot of background on the theory and practice of psychodrama and kind of gives suggested readings and techniques for companies that want to try to experiment with psychodrama in the workplace um, for, for doing this stuff. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting document to look at alongside the film because in a lot of, it's actually kind of an offensive document in a lot of ways. And so it's, but it's, it's interesting to see how these two things looking at them side by side almost start working at cross purposes with each other. But you know, in, in some ways, I, w w one of the things that's really interesting about the, about this film, and really is a lesson is sometimes when we look at films as being history, as sort of encapsulating history, and we look at the structure of the film as and, and we sort of kind of confuse the structure of the film with sort of a um, 
historic, you know, that that it is a, an accurate record of of of, what, uh, of, of history. We sometimes uh, narrative can kind of play us false, meaning psychodrama probably had it works for the film, but it probably is meaningless in terms of what was happening in the, that factory. I mean, the, the, you know, uh, Dennis Jackson and and OIC, which is Philadelphia, you know, Opportunities Industrialization Center had much, much more impact in terms of the relationships in, in terms of what's happening in terms of how black people and and white people uh, are are relating in in work situations and sort of changing power differentials and sort of creating opportunities so the the psychodrama is is uh, 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 the sensitivity training which is what the, the term that is used in the film uh, it's, it's almost a gimmick uh, that 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 serves the film but it doesn't really serve how how things change and it really is like the day-to-day long-term commitment uh of you know, you know folks like dennis jackson and you can actually see it in in terms of how the uh the men sort of relate to dennis jackson uh as opposed to you know the the, the walter you know siobhan you know theatrics but but it, so you know, the lesson for me is like let, let's not let's not assume that this film is some kind of historical truth as opposed to a film that was made for a particular purpose isn't so i'm neither you know an authority on film or a filmmaker or an art historian but it seems to me that part of what's going on also maybe what louis just said relates to this there are two art forms here right there's the filmmaking and there's the Role playing or the drama therapy, and these two art forms don't necessarily coalesce. I mean, in a way, they're competitive. Um, the way it's edited um, and the intention—if this was the intention—to have some kind of interracial reconciliation and understanding, um, they're pulling at each other. Don't you think? No, I, I, I think that the, the psychodrama serves the, the, the filmmaker uh, much more than it serves the men trying to, to, to change the, you know, uh, the situation, trying to have greater economic opportunity. But, but, it's a spectacle. It's a spectacle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. It serves the filmmaker. I, uh, Louis, I 100% agree um, with what you're saying. I think that um, it serves the filmmaker. It also serves like Newsweek, right? Like it's it serves the particular corporate interest of Newsweek too, because as as Greaves himself said, like he he very well understood that Newsweek very explicitly saw this film as a gift to their corporate sponsors. Um, and so they were, um, they were, they were really kind of recruiting Greaves into producing a particular narrative about how business was going to be a solution to um, uh, unemployment, right? Which is an unemployment that's being structurally produced. And the kind of the 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 thing that I think um, uh, is also notable here is this this very phrase the hardcore unemployed right is um itself a very peculiar kind of um very brief explanation for unemployment that re relies entirely on like cultural explanations for why people don't have work or why people do, are pushed out of work um and so i think there's a, a psychodrama serves i think a lot of the the business interests that are um that are, that are um kind of in the background of this particular work. I do think that it's a little bit more than just a gimmick though. One of the things that I found very interesting in doing research um, on thinking about workplace training and particularly workplace training as it, as this, as people were talked about as the, the quote unquote hardcore unemployed is that by the late 1960s, by the time that Greaves actually made this film, um, psychodrama was being used uh, not just in workplaces, but it was being used in other work training programs for people who were who were called um, the quote unquote disadvantaged. 
So it was like kind of the earliest phase of deindustrialization where people are getting like pushed out of work. And these psychodramatic methods of role play and reenactment were being used in work training programs under this theory that you could um, help people learn how to gain interpersonal skills and mechanical skills. And so it was, it, it, Greaves isn't the only one using psychodrama in this case. It may not have been manifesting in all of those places or it'd be, I guess, sociodrama would be the other kind of practice that would be getting used there. But it does have some place within this sort of like moment of um, sensitivity training and all of these things. Um, so it's not exclusively Greaves. Um, although I, I agree with you about, um, you know, Dennis Jackson's work has been, and that long-term work has been so much more important um, in, the, in the long haul uh, than just using reenactment and role play over the course of a couple of days. Maybe it's a good time to just note um, that this has survived in, in contemporary organizations in what is called bias training generally, um, but begins perhaps surprisingly through funding from the armed forces uh, after the Second World War, um, and uh, the inspiration, I think, or certainly, you know, probably the, the main inspiration was my father's concept of sensitivity training, the term that Louis also just used, and Alex used, which at many people, many critics said, um, oh, come on, how can you be trained to be sensitive? I mean, either you are or you aren't. Uh, and I think we don't feel that way so much anymore. I mean, you think about just men's groups, for example, which you know pop up every once in a while, you see stuff about them. Um, so, and, and then from the, from the military side in the 40s, by the way, if you see the beginning of Stripes, Bill Murray's movie, if you see a scene, there's, there's a scene in Stripes, not the beginning, where the sergeant, the tough sergeant is having a little sensitivity session with the man, which is, it's pretty hilarious. Um, this persisted in the military for quite a while, but as Alex noted, it, it got into corporate America in the 50s and 60s. Um, you know, at this time, those of us of a certain age know that there were things called encounter groups uh, at sort of elite retreats like Esalen. Um, and, and corporate America, you know, was trying to adjust to the times and was quite interested in this. Um, whether it really made any difference or not, you know, we can disagree, but um, just in terms of what's going on right now, a few weeks ago, um, because the University of Pennsylvania is really looking within as it should and trying to understand how we have structural, I would say a lack of opportunity for people of color uh, and women in, in our academic organization, their people are being encouraged to fill out forms about sense about bias in in departments and programs and centers at Penn. So it it, it is fascinating, and we can we can go on and on about this. I can certainly go on about this about how this keeps popping up again and again. Um, I actually did bias training at Penn something like seven or eight years ago, uh, and the the trainer asked us to go around and ask us if we had the experience in this kind of situation, this kind of setting, you know, doing training of this core of this sort, looking at ourselves and our prejudices and group work and so forth. And I said, well, yes, as a matter of fact, my father was the founder of psychodrama and a lot of this came out of there and she almost collapsed. Uh, as it turned out, she herself had trained with a psychodramatist. Uh, so in so many ways, we are still living with these ideas and forces. John, this might be a good time for you to unpack psychodrama and sociodrama. I know we had that conversation earlier, and I think those are two terms. It's, 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 they're similar. They're, there's a way that the two inform one another, but they're very distinct, too. And I think it's probably important to make that distinction for, for the audience. Yeah, so, you know, it's a long story, but uh, very briefly, my father went to medical school in Vienna, graduated in 1917. Um, he started a, among many other things in Vienna at that time, he started a a, a, what he called the theater of spontaneity, where he discovered the actor Peter Lorre, among others. He then went to New York as an immigrant in mid 1920s and started a, a, an impromptu theater that, at Carnegie Hall. And he, what he was trying to do was essentially kill the author. 
his view was that each of us should be the author of our own play. We shouldn't take the, what he called the conserve, the words of an author and, and act them. Actors should be themselves and we are all actors, right? As uh, we make our entrances and our exits, a la Shakespeare. Um, so uh, he tried this in, in New York, in, in Carnegie Hall. He attracted lots of interesting artists, people who were interested in Stanislavski method, for example. Um, but he couldn't make it in, the, in, in that world. I mean, couldn't make it with audiences. Audiences rejected it. They found this kind of role-playing stuff. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't, the, it wasn't enough theater for them. It, wasn't, it didn't have an arc, a narrative arc. They got impatient. But he found that when he did this with mental patients, people, or people who had emotional problems, it worked pretty well. I'm simplifying and giving a certain view of my father's biography, but I do think that if he could have stayed in the theater world, he really liked it. He would have loved to stay in the theater world, but it wasn't working. So it came to be a technique anti-psychoanalytic, not analyzing other people's problems, reenacting your situations with actors who would play significant people in your life. And that then gradually, he was a, as, as one of his biographers said, a relentless promoter of his ideas. And gradually that went into the military and, and went into corporate America. It went into these encounter groups. It went into other forms of, of progressive psychotherapy like Gestalt and what, what's called transactional analysis or TA. But I will say that by the time he gets to, the, to this period in his life, was very happy that somebody like Bill Greaves came along because he could never figure out how to get this into media. He tried and he couldn't figure it out. And the period that Alex is studying with my dad, and I, I came along when he was 63 years old, uh, was a very frustrating period for him because he saw his ideas getting into all this, these sectors of society, but he wasn't recognized. He was famous in the 40s and 50s even predicted the outcomes of heavyweight title fights for newspapers. But by the 1960s, he was a little passe because new younger people were coming along. He loved the hippies. He wrote a, uh, two memoirs. One of them was called The King of the Hippies because he thought he was the first one. Uh, but psychodrama itself and his ideas about social networks were being ad adopted and adapted by other people. And he was left behind, I think, in many ways. I love, I love Jonathan's voice. It's like this wonderful stentorian actors. You, 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 you really, it's a stage voice or, or, or radio drama voicing. But anyway, it's sort of. I'm happy, Louis, I'm happy to be discovered. <laughs> Do we want to go back and un unpack hardcore uh, unemployed a little bit more? I, mm. I, one, I'm very curious where that term, it, it, it seems like something that, that it, it, it derived from some sort of government, something or another. So um, is, is that the case? Is that just sort of was mm -hmm. just the, the, the nomenclature of that particular time period? I think we, I think we should just beat it to death and not, and not use it to be quite honest. Cause, and, okay. cause, oh, <laughs> Hardcore meaning that break it. they're not, yeah. it's they're, not they're not serving within the the system and they're not necessarily benefit they're, they're not getting the benefits of the system, but they're also not labor that is usable by the system. But obviously they there, 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 there is labor involved in their lives. And so mm -hmm. uh, and um, but anyway, it's yeah, it, it's it, it's pejorative. So I, I it's 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 not worth uh, trying to re rehabilitate. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely not worth trying to rehabilitate. I mean, it had a very short life. Um, it didn't. It did not last very long. Um, it was. It's a term that emerged in the mid 1960s, um, and I think economic literature, and it kind of got used by journalists and um, politicians and social scientists um, as a way of trying to explain unemployment. What's, I think, 
interesting about it is the way that um, if you do like an ingram search of the use of this term, you can see that it kind of comes up in the like around 1965. It explodes in use around 1968 to 1970, and then it just precipitously drops off. Um, so it has this like it peaks like in the same moment where Greaves is using um, or is making this film. And um, the reasons for its sort of emergence um, and its sort of its durability or not its durability, it's very um, kind of brief prominence, um, I think have a lot to do with the Kerner report of 1968, which was the product of um, the Lyndon Johnson administration when they were, um, it was a, the, for those of you who don't know what the Kerner report is, it is a, um, it was a presidential commission, or the outcome of a presidential commission that was tasked with um, studying the uh, uprisings in 1967 that kind of swept across cities um, and were uh, um, uh, black led protests. And um, in that report, that's where the National Alliance of Businessmen actually is formed in the wake of that report in order to try to put some of its recommendations into practice. So um, the reason why that term gets used so prominently and why I think it's, it's worth discarding completely, I think it's worth understanding like how it came about and why it came about. And that's because the, the National Alliance of Businessmen believed that you know, people who were the quote unquote hardcore unemployed were potential rioters. And so the idea was that if you um, could address the hardcore unemployed, you could stop riots. It was like a preventative measure. Um, there are tons of flaws with this idea. And like I said, it did not last. Um, it, it kind of exploded in use and then disappeared. I think really it disappears around the same time you start to see um, the rise of the kind of Chicago School of Economics and um, which we now associate with theories of neoliberalism. So um, it's sort of like this, this explanation that comes at a very particular political and economic moment where you have sort of this post-war ideology of racial liberalism, which is all about trying to achieve, um, um, it's trying to, to solve racism through civic and economic inclusion. Um, but you have that kind of ideology crashing against the early phases of deindustrialization. And so the hardcore unemployed is in the, this category is an attempt to try to resolve these kind of contradictions. Um, and it's, it's has all kinds of flaws, but I think that context and like where it comes from is a um, important, it, it was important for me to try to understand that and doing the research um, and thinking about why this term is being used and how it's being used. I mean, what did they, can, like, can, I, can I just pay a little tribute to Walter Clavoon? We haven't done that yet the white psychodramatist in the film. Mm -hmm. um, because Walter uh, would have been someone that Bill Greaves would have been quite interested in. It was not accidental that he chose Walter to be the white uh, director uh, who, and by the way, I think, you know, uh, he, his skills as, a, as an impromptu actor are really quite impressive. You get an idea of it in that film. Um, Walter was a journeyman actor on Broadway. He had been in a number of films, minor characters, but very, very versatile. Uh, and um, also was the judge on the old Perry Mason TV series. Walter, like many actors in the early 60s, went to the public psychodrama sessions my, my parents ran uh, uh, in Manhattan for 25 years. You could pay a dollar and a quarter or whatever at the typical admission was to a movie and instead be part of a psychodrama group, uh, six nights a week. Walter was one of the directors uh, and um, he like many actors, people like Don Knotts, who was on the Andy Griffith show and, uh, and Alan Alda and Woody Allen, uh, numbers of actors would go to these public sessions and Walter did as well. And he became involved, so involved that he became a psychodramatist himself. And I think you can see how adaptable he was as an actor to a situation, to a setting. Uh, I was really struck by it. And, and I will say that Walter was a very close friend 
of my family. Um, in fact, the last time uh, I saw him was I think 1981, 1982, um, when we had, my wife and I had dinner with him in the Players Club on Gramercy Park, which is a, uh, a famous, uh, you know, it's a Mecca for, for the actors of a certain era. There's actually a painting, Louis may know this. If, I don't know if you've been to the Players Club or Alex, you should go after the pandemic, even if it's still there, I'm not sure. There's a big, there's an enormous photograph of John Wilkes Booth's brother. Uh, show a big painting, excuse me, a, a portrait painting of John Wilkes Booth's brother, who was a famous actor in the mid 19th century. I actually had a question for Louis. Um, Louis, as a filmmaker um, and as someone who's been um, running the running Scribe um, or founder of Scribe, I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about um, just William, like where like kind of William Greaves's work kind of um, informs your own work as a filmmaker or where um, it informs the work that um, you do with Scribe. Um, if there are any any connections there you would like to highlight. Sure, I mean, I, 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 I look at um, Greaves as being sort of, in, in some ways, the dean of um, Black documentary filmmakers uh, of, of a particular time. Um, uh, I, I met Greaves when uh, I was maybe just just out of college. I, I was working at, at the public TV station in New York and Greaves, uh, Greaves actually had just left, had left um, uh, that station WNET a little bit, I think around the time that uh, he made this film. I think he left in 69 or 70. And um, uh, he, he had set up an office near Columbus Circle where, where, where Channel 13 was. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it was a different, it was a very, very different era of, um, of filmmaking. Number one, um, uh, the cost, you know, of, of, of the, the accessibility of, of, of equipment and uh, of skills were quite, quite different. And um, in order to make a film, one needed to have some sort of much more of, a, of, a, of an economic model to do it. And so I think, you know, and, and we, we sort of touched on this a little bit earlier in, in our earlier conversation that if you look at, at, at Greaves' work over, you know, 30, 40 years, and, and remembering too, then this is kind of interesting with, about this film, you know, Greaves begins as an actor. That, you know, that's, that's, that's Greaves' beginning. And, and there's some wonderful films from the 40s that, you know, Pearl Bowser has, has sort of preserved. And you, you see, you know, Greaves begins as an actor and then goes into filmmaking, works in Canada um, and, and makes some, some pretty extraordinary films there. Um, and, you know, so, but, but the, how, how film is paid for oftentimes determines structure. And so, Greaves develops his craft. I mean, he he becomes um, uh, sort of an executive producer for for Black Journal, which was one of the two first programs on public television nationally. First pro programs, Black or white or Latino or Asian American or Indigenous. That it was, and again, it sort of connects with the Kerner Commission. You know, the Kerner Commission you know, leads to the Carnegie Commission, which leads to kind of the birth of public television as we know it. And two of the first ventures were Black Journal, which uh, Greaves executive produced, and, and Soul, uh, which was a, um, a cultural program um, that ended up being executive produced by Ellis Hazlip. And so, uh, you know, Greaves as someone who has these skills, so he makes these public TV films and then sort of you know, goes out and makes these commission works like this piece for Newsweek that and then he makes you know films for the National Park Service and it isn't until later that that he begins making these longer documentaries that we begin to see on on PBS as the system changes and begins funding independent works 
uh, they wind up on American experience. I mean, he did a, a wonderful Ralph Bunch documentary. He also did a, an, an Ida B. Wells film. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I think this model of, of, of realizing you have a craft and then um, figuring out um, what is the need for that craft, uh, I think is in keeping with, you know, the work we do at Scribe, although, you know, it, you know the needs are different and, and the financial model is, is quite different, but it's still based on uh, really looking at it as, as, as a fundamental, that the filmmaking is this language and how, how do we use this language based on the political economy? What about, there's some, we should talk about the language in the film, it seems to me. So there's the N-word that's used by Walter, in fact, in that role, which, you know, it would have been impossible, I think, now. I don't care how progressive you are <laughs> or, or, or flexible you are uh, as a documentarian to have a white actor saying that on a film for wide distribution. It seems to me, at least, uh, just on the, in the peanut gallery, that that would be not acceptable. There's homophobia in a, in a really interesting way. Uh, and actually, I think in a conversation with James, I, this, that caused me to notice this moment where it looks as though, you know, he's talking about, it, they're talking about their balls and, and, and being emasculated. And it, I, I wanna, I'd like to know how Alex and Louis see this, but it seems to me that was a moment where there was a unit, there was a, a, a a, a moment of all, all the men could kind of rally around maleness uh, and distinguish themselves from gay men. This was a, it seems to me that was a, this was a way to be unified in this room, in this situation. Uh, what ties us together maybe isn't race or whether we're foreman or so-called hardcore unemployed, or, but what ties us together is we're all men. It's in the company of The gender issues, I think, are of, of uh, the gender assumptions of, of, of the film are what are, are most striking. I, I, I can't help but think that um, the editor who later worked with Greaves at Black Journal is, is Madeline Anderson, uh, who made this film called I Am Some, Somebody, which oh, yeah. it's a few years after, uh, but it's it's striking in that it's looking at uh, black women organizing in the hospital and healthcare work in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, again, it's about labor and it's about working, but it's, it's you know, giving, um, it, you know, it, it, it's privileged, it, it's, it's defining and privileging women in, 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 in a role that, that one was not seeing in documentary. And so, I mean, you know, the, the overall, you know, gender lens of the film, I think, is, is uh, yeah, uh, may, is, a, is another thing that makes it kind of hard to, to take in. Um, so. Well, and the gender lens is so, I mean, the gender dimension of the film is so wrapped up as well with how the problem of racism is being constructed in the film and it's also and it's being constructed within i referred to racial liberalism earlier as the kind of like large kind of ideology that's sort of animating um the the film and kind of newsweek and the national alliance of businessmen but i mean i think the so some of the things that i've i, I in the article i've coming out i talk a fair amount about um the language dimensions and i mean i think one of the things that's so interesting to me there are two things I would observe here. One is that that moment where Walter Clavoon uses the slur within um, uh, the role play scenario is uh, an extremely jarring moment. Um, and it is what's, what's interesting to me in it is actually if you listen very carefully to the back and forth between Clavoon and this foreman who is in the role play with him, you see them trying to like, um, it starts off as like, if you're a man, then just act like a man. And they put strong emphasis on man. And then Walter Clavoon uses the slur. And then they switch to worker. Like it's so there's like these interesting kind of layering and substitutions of these terms. And as they're trying to like 
um, engage in this role play. And so I think that was a moment for me that really crystallized trying to think about how the, the, the questions of gender and race in the workplace are absolutely intersecting within um, uh, the, the dynamics that are being documented and also within the sort of like larger framework of the film. And so the thing I also find really interesting about that moment, it's Al Judge who makes that comment um, in, the, uh, in the combined workshop and um, where he uh, makes the kind of homophobic remark um, and it kind of ties together these ideas of emasculation and, um, and homophobia. And um, so I think it's, I, I agree that it's a moment where there's this kind of like a bid for bonding in a way, yeah. but I think there's also something slightly there's something strategically interesting to me about what Al Judge is doing in that moment as well. Because if you recall, that claim is being made at a point where he's actually critiquing one of the foremen who is not really engaging in the role play, right? Who is trying, he, he in doing the reenactment, instead of actually doing what Al Judge remembers him doing, which was this kind of like humiliation of him on the factory floor, He's instead trying to perform this sort of like very rational attitude and this taking like a kind of distanced approach to the role play. And um, part of what I think a judge is doing there is a little bit kind of calling his bluff in terms of how he's trying to present himself in front of the, the how that foreman is trying to present himself in front of the camera and how he's trying to present himself in front of the other people in that workshop. And um, I think the way I interpret that moment is that, um, you know, the whole idea of, of racial liberalism is that, um, you know, racism is a byproduct of people being psychically and geographically distant from each other. And the way that you can solve racism is by bringing them into contact and bringing them into identification. And Al Judge's comment actually demonstrates the extent to which that is just not true. Like he's making the point that it's like, it's like we're not distant from each other. Like are the divisions of labor that are being negotiated in the workplace actually put us into intimate contact with each other and allow you to enjoy your authority by like humiliating me on the factory floor. And so he's, he's both, it's both, it's like a very ambivalent moment for me in the film because it both is kind of participating in that sort of male bonding and is using this homophobic language at the same time that it's totally undermining the premise of racial liberalism that is like animating the, the kind of, even the use of psychodrama as a, as a tool. Um, so that's, it's, it's a complex, it's, I think it's to Greaves' credit that he captures these really complex moments. Um. Well, we don't have questions yet. We can continue to, to dialogue a bit if, if there's still some things that, that people want to, to dig a little deeper into. Seems like we've covered a lot of, of ground so far though. Well, one of the um, virtues of psychodrama or sociodrama and, uh, in this kind of setting uh, say the, the, a racial interracial encounter is supposed to be the idea, according to my my father at least, of of role reversal. That um, each each you could step into the skin of the other person. Do you think either of you that that was a, a first of all effective in the film, and was it a and did it come across in uh, from a filmic standpoint? the idea of role reversal. To, to, to me, the, the most powerful um, interchange within the um, sensitivity training, whatever, was when, uh, I, I forget the name of, of, of the guy, when he's, um, uh, it's sort of set up that he often comes in late to work and then uh, there's that interchange and, and he's, and he's He's himself, and um, and but what he's doing is is revealing his own reason and rationale because he, you know he's still being called he's still a shipper he's still a, a packer when he wants to be a shipper or whatever 
And um, that to me is the most, that to me is the most powerful interchange that, 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 that stayed with me. But uh, so, so I, yeah, I don't know if the role reversal really does um, um, succeed as, as drama, but, uh, uh, but I think in, in terms of feeling like I've learned new information, I think I, le I learned a lot from, from that particular uh, that's, yeah, scene. That's interesting. And that's what, one of the goals actually of role reversal is to, is to tease out information in the situation that wouldn't otherwise emerge. Yeah, I mean, I do think it's, I think it's, um, I think there's both something really compelling for me as a viewer of this film. I agree with Louis, that scene with Charles Darby, I think is the one that is, um, he's the, he's the, the man who is the, um, having the, the role play about how he's been denied a job in shipping um, that's kind of constantly held out to him as like kind of a carrot. Um, and uh, I think that it's, one of the things I think is interesting about Greaves' film and the way that is the way that it simultaneously is able to have these very moving moments that have um, a kind of, that, has, that have a lesson that actually go beyond its sort of narrow purpose as a training film. Its function as a training film, I think, is something that I'm much more ambivalent about and much more kind of um, skeptical of. I mean, I think the, I think role, I think actually role reversal is, um, in terms of the training film itself, is not, I don't know that it does that much, really. What I think is sort of mo very interesting and very troubling to me in this training film is, the w is actually the place of Walter Clavoon within this sort of therapeutic division of labor that's being performed. So the line that really almost made me sit like upright in my seat the first time I heard it was the moment where Walter Clavoon is working with the factory foreman and he says something like, um, he's like, well, you know, these are the things that I heard them say in the, um, in the sessions and I'm kind of bringing all that into these sessions with you. And um, it's not clear that actually that sort of movement of information is moving in two directions. It actually seems to me it's quite extractive. It's moving from like Walter Clavoon is picking up information out of the sessions with um, the black workers and is sort of transferring that in this sort of very controlled performed encounter with the white factory foreman who are then themselves the managers of other black laborers who are not anywhere in the film, right? So there's this, there's a strange kind of movement of bodily information of affect and feeling that make for me, the, 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 the black men in the film, um, they are workers, right? They are working in this film. They're producing something, they're producing affect, they're producing feeling, they're producing information that is then being like, moved into a new place and it's being moved through Walter Clavoon, right? He becomes the kind of mediator there. And what ended up being um, kind of the thing I started thinking about with that is I actually started looking up to see like had J.L. Mourinho written anything on um, like, uh, or like in, in the course of reading some of his works, I was really struck by the fact that he went to Harlem in the 1940s in the wake of the 1943 riots. And he was working with people in Harlem um, to do these psychodrama sessions. And he refers to bringing people who had participated in the uprising into the workshop space where they weren't actually necessarily asked to perform. They were instead asked to be informants, right? They were supposed to pass information to the psychodramatic, the auxiliary egos, the people who were kind of there as these sort of assistants for the role play, they were supposed to pass information to them that they could then convert into a psychodrama session. Right. That dynamic is actually playing out here as well. Um, I think the men like Al Judge, men like Charles Darby, they're positioned as informants, right? Um, and I think that's a really, that's a, that's a kind of consequential dimension of this to me that makes me very, it's, it's, a, it's an aspect of the film I'm very critical of and an aspect of kind of psychodrama that I'm, I'm very critical of. 
Um, so that's what really, that extractive relationship more than the role reversal is, uh, is something I draw attention to. You know, I was also struck that, um, and this might be a projection, that Walter made quite an effort at legitimizing the psychiatrist. And as though he, was, he had to convince the white foreman that this was a credible person, mm -hmm. uh, although he had black skin. Now I might've been projecting that, but it, it, it struck the way that he introduced him very, you know, kind of casually, but also by uh, making sure that people were aware of his credential mm -hmm. uh, as a professional person, as a physician, a psychiatrist. I thought that was, it, I, I, it, I noted it. Mm -hmm as though he was, had to validate him. Yeah. Um, uh, there's two questions that I'll, I'll pose to the group. Um, the first one's from Sheila. Who do you feel the intended audience was for the film at the time of production? Newsweek sponsorship, the white majority, the, hard and the hardcore unemployed? Secondly, uh, do you see this level of psychodrama being used as a tool as, as, a, tool, as a potential means of positive change today? via mainstream media? Hmm. Who was the audience? Alex? I think maybe Alex would know about that. Well, so the audience, the audience for this would have been other factory foremen in a lot of cases. I mean, it was used, it was, it was distributed with, and it was marketed, um, I think by Newsweek toward, um, toward companies. Um, and so there's a syllabus that's held in the Black Film Center archive that is, um, was distributed along with uh, the film. And um, it, 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 was a, it was an effort of the National Alliance of Businessmen, um, this group that was put together, as I mentioned before, by the Johnson administration. And so I think really it, was, it had a very practical function, had a very practical purpose. It was shown in some film festivals. Um, it was, I think I said this earlier, it was shown to both, the, both of all the men who participated in the film. Um, so, uh, but I think the, the intended audience, I think is primarily, um, it's, it's a, a, a gift to the corporate sponsors of Newsweek and it is for uh, factory foremen, largely. Hmm. Yeah. Do you Certainly, my dad would have said that in answer to the second question, James, that um, a true therapeutic method has to have no less of a, of a group of participate, participants than the whole of mankind. Uh, and he, he, he actually started in, in uh, the 1930s, a, a company called Therapeutic Motion Pictures, which he tried to make, he tried to make motion pictures of psychotherapy, uh, particularly of psychodrama. And his idea was that ultimately everybody in, would be, participate somehow in the, in the psychodrama, everybody being everybody in the world. And, the, and what was going on in the film was a model uh, for everybody in the world. Um, now, you know, he didn't have the tools, the technical tools to do that. He came along, a, psych, television wasn't all that interested in doing psychodramas, uh, um, although he hoped and tried and pushed uh, to get psychodrama onto television. Um, the, the internet, you know, would have made him very happy as perhaps as a potential vehicle for a simultaneous global psychodrama. And he certainly would have said, he died in 1974, he said at the age of 85, he certainly would have said that the, the world needs his ideas now more than ever. The second question um, is specifically for Alex, but anyone can answer it. Um, Alex, can you share any info about the person who co-wrote the voiceover narration with Greaves? and who the imagined audience was for the film and how it was actually distributed and received. Specifically thinking about the moment when the white foreman does a hyper correction of fellas to men and the way the voiceover um, belabors this point. Yeah, I can, I can briefly um, speak that. So the person who co-wrote the, the narration with Greaves is a man named Jack Gobbler. Um, I don't know, anything about him. I don't know if he was 
someone who Greaves brought into the production or if he was somebody from Newsweek um, who was involved with it. Um, because Newsweek did produce like a fair amount of material like sort of around this particular work. Um, Greaves was primarily responsible for, the, for making the film. Um, but I don't unfortunately know, I've never been able to figure out who Jack Godler uh, was. So um, I do appreciate you bringing up the moment about um, the, the, and I'd love to hear actually uh, Louis and Jonathan, your thoughts on that moment in the film where it repeats itself, because uh, that's, the, that's the second moment that for me where I sat bolt upright in my seat <laughs> watching it for the first time, because it really clarified for me how the film is itself, um, it's not just about psychodrama, but it's actually a kind of experiment in trying to translate psychodramatic principles of repetition and reenactment into the medium of film. And I think that is a, that's, was a really significant um, kind of moment where, you know, the function of that replay, when you're thinking about the intended audience for this film as a group of foremen who are being trained is to kind of invite them into this sort of fold of sensitivity. And so it's a, that's, I think it's formally very interesting what's happening there. And it also, I mean, it got, it, I alluded earlier to another introduction for the film that seems to not really exist in a lot of the library copies, but there's, um, there is an introduction from someone at Newsweek who talks about how the film um, is itself a translation of psychodrama. Like that was very explicitly a framework for talking about um, mm -hmm. this work. So, but, um, Louis and Jonathan, I, I feel like I've been talking too much and I'd really love to hear your thoughts on this, um, on this, you know, um, I, that I, moment in the I'm film. Learning a lot. Yeah, I, I, I love that moment as well. It actually is a moment when the film is, feels Greaves-esque in that mm -hmm. it's, intelligence of that moment really strikes me. I mean, when you, when, when you think of that in, 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 and you sort of compare it to sort of direct cinema at that time or, and you know, the, uh, so it's saying, okay, I'm going to borrow from this technique. And, and again, you know, in, in, in symbio, psycho taxoplasm, right? I've always mixed up the title. I mean, it's, uh, it, yeah, it, it, it's grieves. But what, what, and just in terms of the credits, and this is not about the other writer, but uh, you know, Kathleen Collins was mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, the, I guess the, the assistant editor, the, the chief. And Kathleen Collins is this extraordinary, extraordinary filmmaker. Uh, that uh, you know worked as an editor, a wonderful novelist, writer, uh, and really somebody who um, understands narrative construction. So it was just really wonderful to see her name in, in, in the final credits of the film. You know, what you're making me think about also, both of you, is uh, about that moment, the instant replay, um, is that Bill got the importance of laughter and humor uh, in very heavy in a very heavy situation. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, off to the side here, I'll say um, I grew up in in my father's mental hospital, essentially, uh, where he had his psychodrama center, training center, and his and his patients who did psychodrama. And um, when I say that I grew up in a mental hospital, very often people will look at me and say, "Oh God, that must have been so sad." But actually, it, it was not a sad place. And one of the reasons it wasn't a sad place was that uh, my father thought that unlike psychoanalysis, which is it's very hard to get humor if you're on a couch and you're having your neuroses explored. But if you're in theater, you can get a lot of humor. There's a lot, there's a lot of laughter. And I saw many sessions of psychodrama sessions of them about really, really sad stuff uh, with mental patients, but also with ordinary people who had problems. And there was a lot of laughter. Um, so I, I, now that you, you know, I had not thought about this until the two of you were talking about that moment again, um, that, you know, it was important to have that moment. That was, that was a climax and it wasn't a grim climax. It was a, it was a release of, of, of tension and the laughter is very therapeutic. Did it really bring them together and bond them? I don't know. <laughs> I'm a little skeptical, but Greaves got that. 
So we'll take one last question. And this one is from Anastasia. Uh, the, gener the generative act of role playing is also key to symbio psycho taxi plasm. Is there any understanding that Greaves used that aspect of this film as a springboard for that storyline? He had, so I, I think he was just, he was very interested in psychodrama during uh, throughout his career, but especially at this time. Um, and he actually filmed Symbiopsychotaxiplasm before working on In the Company of Men. So I think they come out of the same moment of his, um, his filmmaking and the way he was thinking about film. Um, there was a point, another point I wanted to make about that. Um, something else I was gonna say jumped right out of my head, but if, I'm sure it'll come back to me if other people wanted to, to chime in on this. Was it about humor? Give us a laugh, Alex. <laughs> well, I mean, Symbio Psychotaxiplasm is a very funny film. Um, so uh, he was certainly, certainly interested in that. Um, the point I was gonna make about psychodrama, oh, I think, so psychodrama, I think was, what I think he was very interested in, about psychodrama in combination with cinema verite as a documentary style, um, as I've kind of picked up from reading some of his work is that um, he, like cinema verite's kind of promise is to try to capture, like capture life, right? It like captures life through the recording apparatus. But Greaves was also, I think he was very interested in how um, the very presence of a recording device necessarily transforms the reality that it is trying to record. Like simply putting a camera and a microphone in front of somebody's face necessarily means that they act differently. And so he was kind of, I think he saw psychodrama as something that he could combine with cinema verite in order to like get at something real. He was interested in getting at something real through these artificial devices, right? Or through these, through these devices that in some ways kind of mess with the idea that you can ever access an unmediated reality. And so he really brings that question, what psychodrama does and what cinema verite for Greaves does is it really brings the question of mediation to the very forefront of his practice. Um, and you see that a lot in Symbiopsychotaxiplasm with the like, recording of the cameras recording and like all of that kind of stuff. So I think that's, that's where I think he's kind of like, there's some connection between um, those two. This is the thing I was gonna say. I did find out interestingly uh, about psychodrama and Greaves. I had spent a long time trying to figure out how Greaves even found out about psychodrama. Um, I theorized for a while that it had to do with his exposure to and his participation in the actor studio which was using a lot of um, Stanislavski's uh, uh, methods of acting and um, there was some dialogue there between method acting and kind of psychodrama at the time um, but I, I did uh, at an event um, last year that was taking place in New Jersey that um, I was uh, lucky to participate in um, I kind of mentioned my, my theory and Louise Greaves, his uh, longtime partner and collaborator was in the audience. And she actually came up to me at the end and she told me it wasn't the actor's studio where William Greaves learned about psychodrama. It was actually, he saw an advertisement for the Mourinho Institute on uh, the street and he thought it sounded interesting. And so he just like took the train up to, up to it and went to the Institute, which I thought was, I was just like, man, I spent, so much time <laughs> trying to figure out how Greaves found out about psychodrama. And it turns out it was like on the street. That's how I came across it. So it was funny. So much for heavy scholarship, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, there, was a, there was a theater critic named Eric Bentley uh, who said the best theater in New York is at Moreno Psychodrama Theater. Um, 78th and Broadway, six nights a week. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, word of mouth and yes, they did post stuff to get people in. Um, and uh, they, they violated, I would only say this, uh, that place closed down 1974. 
there's now a, a, a place called Stand Up New York there, a club there. Uh, and uh, they violated the, the fire laws on many occasions, uh, squeezing people into that building to see a psychodrama that came out of these, uh, you know, it could be 125 strangers who just showed up and paid a buck. And that's a good place to end. Thank you all so much for this conversation. Greatly appreciate it. Um, Thanks to you and the ICA. Thank you, James. You're welcome. You're welcome. And, and thank you, uh, Beth, for captioning, Derek, and, and Natalie for your support as well. Um, briefly, Natalie popped in um, a survey. So please fill it out so we know how best to, to provide and serve the community. And also just to let you all know, there's two more, there's a couple more programs coming up, three programs for, for Vaughn. This Sunday, um, two Penn graduate students, Tyler Shine and Narendra Haynes, will facilitate an open dialogue about um, Vaughn's work. And then on Wednesday, April 21st, David Hart, the Carafell Assistant Professor in Fine Arts at Weitzman, and Zoe Ryan, the Daniel W. Dietrich II Director at ICA, We'll discuss ways in which the built environment both frames and opens up entrenched social rules and modes of human behavior for re-examination and discovery using Vaughn's work as a starting point. So for more information on both of those exhibition, I mean, both of those programs, you can um, go to the exhibition page on our website to find out more information. So thank you again, uh, gentlemen. It was, I really enjoyed it, learned, learned a lot. So, thank you. And Thanks everyone have a good night. Good night. Good night.